The Earth's crust is comprised of enormous plates that are in constant yet subtle motion. What do you think are some of the geographic results of the movement and collision of these tectonic plates? The forces within the Earth are powerful enough to twist, turn, and juggle the planet's crust, including land masses and the sea floor. The theory that explains just how Earth's forces move large segments of the crust around is called plate tectonics. Under the Earth's crust is the mantle, a mass of hot liquid material. As the mantle circulates, the crust, divided into enormous plates, slides around. The crust moves in response to swirling masses of magma or molten rock. Land is pulled apart shoved together, and reshaped. By 260 million years ago, the plates had jammed together to form a supercontinent called Pangaea, meaning all land. But this huge continent began to pull apart, and over millions of years it split. Some 65 million years ago, our modern continents began to take shape. One look at the shorelines of Africa and South America makes it easy to imagine these continental pieces as a whole. More evidence for continental drift can be picked up and carried away. And here is just the piece of evidence that I need. Professor Michael Rampino takes a piece of hard volcanic basalt from Argentina across the Atlantic Ocean to the world's most ancient desert in the South African country of Namibia. I've traveled more than 4,000 miles, and the rocks are exactly the same. They're basalts, and the age is 135 million years. But the best evidence for continental drift may be that it's still at work reshaping the globe. Like land, the ocean floor changes too. The Atlantic Ocean owes its very existence to a split between the modern continents of Africa and the Americas. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge, marking the boundary between two tectonic plates, is pulling apart and shoving the continents apart at a rate of about an inch a year. Meanwhile, six kilometers beneath the surface of the ocean, plumes of hot rock are pushing upward. When this magma reaches the surface, it boils up in the cracks between plates and creates volcanoes. The red dots on this modern map represent volcanic activity around the globe. Each volcanic line marks boundaries between tectonic plates. The consequences of volcanic activity can be devastating to life on the land, but it also creates much of the land on which life evolves. In 1963, 93 million square meters of lava produced this island off the coast of Iceland in a matter of days. When tectonic plates smash together, mountains may be shoved up in the process. The collision of the Eurasian and Indo-Australian land masses produced Earth's youngest and tallest mountain range. The Himalayas grew from sea level to a height of five miles over 30 million years. As a result of plate movements, world geography changes slowly but constantly. Today we're talking about plate tectonics and you should have your quiz open. Uh, on its learning and you can follow right along as we go. This is lecture one on plate tectonics and what you're looking at here is actually a photo of my lovely wife. 
standing at a fissure uh, in northern Iceland. So if you kind of watch that video we just saw, uh, northern or Iceland uh, is, is a unique location in that it's very tectonically active. It's sitting right on top of the mid-Atlantic ridge uh, that runs through the ocean, and it's a site where uh, the, the island itself of Iceland is literally pulling apart in the middle. And as it pulls apart, new material is formed uh, this is in northern Iceland, and so this is this is the the uh, essentially an exposed section of the mid mid Atlantic Ridge, and you can see that big crack there where my wife's standing beside. Uh, on one side of that uh, is one tectonic plate. On the other side is the other tectonic plate. So that crack right there is is widening, um, and other cracks around that area are widening at a rate of maybe somewhere between like four to six centimeters a year. That's, uh, that's not very fast, but it's about the same rate as your fingernails grow. So if you're wondering how fast uh, those plates are moving, it's, it's not very fast, but it is, is actually measurable. And of course, when they do move, we experience things like earthquakes and the like. Um, so that's a really unique place there. And if you look, you can't quite see how deep that crack goes down, but it goes down a pretty good little ways. And it's different in various parts. You can see if you look along it, it goes way, way out there quite some ways. And there's some mountainous looking things in the background. Those are actually volcanoes. So yeah, volcanism goes right along with plate tectonics. Earthquakes go right along with plate tectonics. Um, this, is, this is actually known as the Maivatan Rift um, in Iceland. And if you go, as we did, uh, kind of down into that rift uh, from the other side there, you can't quite see in this picture, um, what's underneath of it is actually this really cool pool of water um, that was uh, very, very hot. It was so hot indeed that you couldn't even really hold your feet in it for very long because uh, it would burn you. Um, so that's heated from those geothermal forces uh, deep within the earth that are responsible for the movement of the plates. Um, so let's talk a little bit about today about how our current understanding of the motion of those plates came about uh, and sort of what's what's making it all happen. So the person that we have to really introduce here uh, is a guy by the name of Alfred Wegener. Uh, there's his name right there if you're looking for it on your quiz. Uh, so old Elfie came up with this concept known as continental drift. It was a hypothesis. Um, and remember, uh, a hypothesis still needs uh, quite a bit of testing before it can be accepted as, as a theory. So he's got this hypothesis that says essentially that the continents had all been once formed as a single supercontinent altogether um, in this thing that he called Pangaea, uh, which is uh, Latin meaning all land. So Essentially, he was saying that every continent on our surface were con was connected together, um, and then it began to broke up, break apart somewhere around about 200 million years ago uh, and formed the present land masses that we see today. Now, uh, we're going to talk more about this, but uh, I want you to kind of recognize that Wegener had a, a, a lot of like really a lot of evidence for this, and there was some evidence for this that was just like astoundingly like like strong evidence um, yet his his hypothesis was never actually accepted by the scientific community in fact uh, we didn't understand that he was correct until long after he had actually died um, but uh, we'll, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit as we go so let's take a look at Pangaea and its formation here so uh, going back about uh, 250 million years ago, uh, Pangaea consisted of all the major continents. If you look towards the, the top of your uh, diagram there on the picture I've got, you see that Pangaea is formed there. We've got the Tethys Sea between two of the, con the continent there. Um, uh, it's a combination of two larger continents known as Laurasia and Gondwanaland, kind of funny names there. Then round about 200 million years ago, uh, rifting starts to occur. Okay, so um, essentially that whole supercontinent starts to pull apart and become more similar to what we see today. And as you follow through the pictures there, 
you see that it kind of works its way up to uh, present day. So the we, you would not have recognized the landmass 200 million years ago. It wouldn't have looked like our modern continents uh, really at all. And I want you to kind of think about for a second just how long ago this is. This is way predating the end of the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs go extinct 65 million years ago. We're talking 200 million years ago. This is a long time ago. Um, what did the continents look like before that? Uh, we have considerable evidence the, um, that they were in different locations. Uh, in fact, this is probably not the first supercontinent. There were numerous supercontinents, uh, at least two others, before Pangaea um, that we have given names to. Um, but th this is the one we have the strongest evidence for. Not surprising because it was the most recent supercontinent. Um, will there be supercontinents in the future? Undoubtedly, there's going to be more supercontinents. The continents are moving around right now. They will eventually collide in different locations and we'll probably have another large supercontinent. It's going to be a long time after we're all gone, but uh, this is something that will happen again on Earth. It's kind of a cycle. Um, so uh, kind of move that forward there. By about 60, it's not on there, but by about 65 million years ago, at the time the dinosaurs are going extinct, you would have been able to recognize most of our continents. They would have been a whole heck of a lot closer together, um, but you can actually see there how, say, South America really fits really nicely into, nestles right into Africa, how North America and, and Europe, they all kind of really snuggle right in together. Um, it, it's like puzzle pieces. So when Wegener came up with this concept of continental drift, it, it really, it shouldn't have really surprised anybody because school children, since like the, the beginning of maps, had recognized that the continents looked like puzzle pieces. That's a tremendous piece of evidence. Uh, if you were to cut out all the continents, most of them you could match up pretty easily just by going, you know, how does this puzzle piece fit with that puzzle piece? Um, it, it's, it's not surprising if you've ever looked at a map. Um, but Wegener is the guy who really put this all together and found a, a whole bunch more evidence. Uh, so let's talk some more about the evidence that he had. He uh, had found matching fossils uh, for uh, on different continents, different land masses that were not only the same age but the same types of fossils. Uh, and where those fit up, they match perfectly with where the puzzle pieces fit up. And many of these fossils are things that really couldn't have traveled or swam across a giant ocean. They were fossils that, of creatures that, that wouldn't, have, wouldn't have traveled through an ocean that kind of distance. So it made sense that the continents had been together. Um, other pieces of information that he had, uh, he had information about the rock types and structures between different continents. If we look at mountain ranges, there are mountain ranges that start on one continent uh, and actually continue on a landmass that's across an entire ocean. So if you put those back together, not only do the puzzle pieces match up, the fossils match up, but the mountain belts match up as well, as long as you kind of delete the oceans out of the picture. Um, that's some pretty strong evidence, right? Similar rocks on similar continents, similar ages, similar types, they had to have formed at the same time, especially if there were similar creatures living on those two land masses. Now, uh, what you don't know about Wegener is that Wegener was actually, he was actually a, a glacial scientist. He studied glaciers. He was very interested um, in the poles. He was very interested in evidence of past glaciations. And one of the big pieces of evidence that he found was that he looked at glacial striations, those grooves that glaciers carve in rock as they travel across the surface of the continents. He also looked at drop stones, which are stones that have been you know, embedded in glacial ice that's broken off, it's calved off the glaciers, and it's floated out into the oceans, and where the glaciers melt, those stones get dropped. So putting that evidence together, uh, what Wegener found out was that it, it, sometime in the distant past, not only were the continents connected together, but the continents were actually sitting much, much closer to uh, one of the poles 
which of course caused these glacial striations which pointed outwards from the pole. Um, and he found gl glacial drop stones as well as evidence. So he had a ton of evidence that this, this had to be going on, yet it still wasn't accepted by the scientific community. So we're gonna talk about that here in a second. But let's look at some of the pictures here. Here's some matching mountain ranges. Uh, you can look at the Appalachian Mountains there in North America. They match up perfectly with the British Isles and the Caledonian Mountains up through Scandinavia. If we put those pieces back together, look at how neatly Africa, South America, North America, Europe, Greenland, all those continents just fit right nice and neat together. And once you do it, the mountain range lines up as though it had always been there right together. So it's some pretty strong evidence, right? Now, uh, let's look at the glacial evidence. If you put the glaciers into the picture, as did Wegener, you can see now that uh, as you put those together from the bottom picture up towards the top picture, we find that Antarctica, the South Pole, um, is where most of the, a big chunk of those continents, the supercontinent, was located. And the little blue arrows there are showing you the directions that the glacial ice traveled based on what we understand about the striations and the drop stones. So we can even locate the, the actual South Pole uh, on those ancient land masses just based on the glacial evidence. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but it, it fits together like really, really nicely. Um, one continent that you'll notice is a little bit weird is India. We'll talk about that later as we go on. But uh, suffice it to say, India was not always connected to the landmass that it's connected to today. It used to be a separate thing altogether, um, and it moved quite a bit. So we'll, we'll come back to that one. All right, as we go along here, let's discuss why nobody accepted Wegener's hypothesis. And it really boils down to one simple fact. He essentially, he had no mechanism. He had no way of explaining why or how the continents move. He had loads of evidence that they had moved. I mean, look at all that evidence I just showed you. He just had no mechanism. So you can imagine the scientific community at the time um, looking at, at Wegener's idea and saying, boy, that's, that's really great, Elfie, but, you know, there's a problem here because none of us think that, like, solid Earth could move as far as you're saying that it could move. Like, like what's the mechanism? How could it have moved? And he, he honestly had no idea. Um, he, he did make some propositions, like all of which I think were wrong. Um, but he was kind of scorned and, and sort of made fun of. In fact, people actually uh, said that he had things like wandering pole disease and, and, and things like that, which is kind of humorous, um, but not very nice. Uh, considering that he, he had, of course, the, the right answer here, he just didn't know how. Um, so that was the big problem. Now, later on when we discovered new things, um, in particular, the spreading at the ocean ridges, um, when we linked up the earthquake evidence, uh, we started to recognize that this was definitely, he was on the right track. And a new theory was created known as plate tectonics. So it kind of encompasses all of Wegener's uh, evidence, and it, it, it actually explains what's going on. So it, from kind of here on out, you'll hear me talking about plate tectonics, because that's our modern theory. That's the actual accepted explanation for what's going on and how it works, and it combines all of Wegener's evidence as well. Okay, but remember, he, he was not, his ideas were not accepted because he couldn't come up with a mechanism for how this actually occurred. So according to plate tectonics, what's actually going on is the uppermost part of the mantle, along with the crust, uh, which is known as the lithosphere, which is, which is essentially a way of saying the hard, rocky upper layer of the earth, including the crust and part of the upper mantle, uh, is riding around on this area known as the asthenosphere, which is not liquid. Uh, it's a part of the mantle that's, that's sort of it's so hot that it behaves more like a silly putty, like a, like a, like a dough almost. It, it can move almost like a slushy sort of a material. It's not fully liquid. Um, now, I'm sure if you drilled down to it and relieved the pressure, it would 
more than likely come out as a liquid lava. Um, but down there deep underneath the Earth's crust, underneath all that pressure, uh, it, it kind of behaves more like silly putty more than anything else. So when we talk about a plate, we're not just talking about the crust, we're actually talking about a little hunk of the upper mantle as well. Um, and that whole thing together is known as lithosphere in that it's, it's a hard, rocky sort of material that's floating on top of this asthenosphere. Now, the plates uh, kind of are divided up into sort of two groups. There is, um, there is, there are plates that contain uh, continental crust where there's continents, um, and there are plates that contain oceanic crust where there's ocean crust, and there's plates that contain both both of those on the same plate. <coughs> so don't don't think of this as just just ocean or just continent, um, but but a plate can contain both of those things on it. Now let's talk about the different boundaries that occur on the various plates. So there's three main types of boundaries. Uh, there's divergent, convergent, and then what are known as transform boundaries. So uh, there's a question there for you to put these all together and kind of think about what they're doing. So let's, let's talk through them here. In a divergent boundary, what's going on is exactly what it sounds like. The plates are diverging. Like that picture that I showed you there of my wife standing in Iceland, those are two plates and they're spreading apart. They are diverging. Um, so this could be continent, it could be ocean, uh, but it's pulling apart. So anytime that you've got plates pulling apart, you have new material, new lithosphere um, forming between them, making more um, lithospheric material. In a convergent boundary, you've got two plates coming together, and we're going to see various things happen as to whether or not we're talking ocean crust to ocean crust, or ocean crust to continental crust, or continental crust to continental crust. Um, different things are going to form and different things are going to happen, but two plates are actually coming together in a convergent boundary. In a transform fault boundary, what's going on are two plates are not coming together or pulling apart, they're actually sliding past each other. So there's no new material being formed or destroyed here, as in the case of the other two boundaries, whereas a divergent is forming new material and a convergent, uh, for the most part, is destroying material. Uh, in a transform fault boundary, it's just slipping and sliding past uh, each other. So we're not making more or making less material. Here's a nice picture, kind of shows you what those three boundaries look like. In a divergent boundary, that one there is, is along a mid-ocean ridge. Uh, you've got new material welling up there in the, in the inside and the material moving outwards on the two plates. In a convergent boundary, you'll notice that one plate, that ocean plate there on the left, is getting pushed underneath, or what we say subducted, underneath the, the chunk of continent there. And notice how parts of it are melting and, and moving towards the top and actually making volcanoes and mountain ranges there. Uh, this is very common. Uh, along a convergent boundary to see mountain ranges and, and volcanoes. And then finally we've got a transform fault boundary. That one happens to be in the ocean and it could, could be on land. They're, the two plates are sliding past each other so you can imagine all that friction. We're talking a lot of earthquakes along the transform fault boundary. Okay, we're going to talk about each of these sort of in, in bits and uh, there's some questions there as to what's going on depending the on the type of uh, crust that's that's uh, being involved in the situation. So follow along as we go here. In divergent boundaries, um, these things, th the vast majority of divergent boundaries are along what we call the oceanic ridges. Um, and this is also uh, called seafloor spreading. So the seafloor is spreading apart. Uh, that's what's actually Iceland is sitting on top of one of those zones where the seafloor is spreading apart. It just happens to be so hot there that the plumes of material are, are making so much new rock that it actually breaches the surface of the ocean there and, and is, forms an island. Um, so that's kind of pretty different than Hawaii, which we'll talk about later on, but Hawaii is sitting on top of what's known as a hot spot in the middle of a plate, so it's not on a boundary. Um, so, 
oceanic ridges are these continuous, like elevated mountain ranges that uh, go essentially on the floors through the centers of uh, all the major ocean basins on our planet. If you were to drain the water off of our planet, the most noticeable thing would not be the continents. The most noticeable things would be these ridges that wrap all around our, our, our whole earth that look like the stitches on a baseball. Uh, and it's a really a huge mountain range down there. And, and there's essentially a mountain on either side of this big, big uh, divergent area um, between the two plates. Okay, um, something called a rift valley is is a is a deep faulted structure found along uh, the axes of divergent plate boundaries. These can be on sea floor or on land. So. Uh, Wherever there's rifting going on, uh, you have what's known as a rift valley. It's the big depression that's between the oceanic ridges. Uh, this is a, a, there's a huge rift valley on the surface there in Africa, known as the African Rift, and it's visible from space. It's it's a big gap. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. Um, and finally, down here, seafloor spreading is just uh, where new oceanic lithosphere is being produced because those plates are pulling apart there. Here's a picture of some seafloor spreading. We've got, uh, actually, this is a picture of a rift valley forming on land and then some seafloor spreading. So at the very, very top there, what's going on is, is the, the earth is starting to pull away. The, the lithosphere is being pulled from both directions and there's some very hot material upwelling from underneath. And as that occurs, there's lots of earthquakes. Uh, there's kind of a mountainous ridge that forms on either side of that valley. And the valley itself is a big depression. This is exactly what's happening in the African Rift Valley. Uh, so it's spreading apart right there. Eventually, if that rift, when it, when it essentially makes its way to the ocean, the ocean's gonna inundate that. The ocean's gonna flood in and fill that whole rift valley basin there with ocean water. And then we end up with a sea, like this long line, this linear looking sea. And as it continues to pull apart, uh, you end up with an oceanic ridge in the middle and the two pieces of continental crust moving apart. Uh, so uh, that's sort of how continents split apart and new oceans form. Um, these continental rifts uh, that I was just mentioning, uh, that's just where, where that's developing on a continent, okay? Where the continent's splitting in, in two and fragmenting and, and forming a rift. And then eventually we'll end up with an, an oceanic uh, spreading center there. Here's a picture of the East African Rift Valley. We've got uh, essentially one side of it. I think the other side would be off to the left. It's a pretty big valley. It's spread apart uh, considerably. Uh, but you've got like a big mountain range on one side, big mountain range on the other, and then this flat depression uh, in between. Eventually, that thing is going to connect with the ocean, and ocean water is going to start moving into that, and we'll have a new shallow ocean form there. Uh, you can imagine uh, in a shallow ocean like that, you'd have lots of coral reefs. It would be a really amazing uh, environment. Let's talk now about what happens when plates come together, okay, along a convergent boundary. So everything we've talked about here um, is a divergent boundary. So now converging, a convergent boundary, causes something known as a subduction zone. Okay, um, this is when uh, you end up having uh, one plate forced down into the mantle underneath a second plate. In, in the case of any two uh, plates coming together, if there's oceanic material and continental material, the oceanic material will always subduct underneath the continental material. So uh, if you're looking at that on your quiz, if you've got an oceanic to continental boundary, the oceanic crust will go under the continental crust. Now, why is that? Well, th the main reason is that oceanic crust is made up of mostly basalt. Basalt is much denser, heavier, if you will, than the granitic type of material that's on the continent. So continents are lighter than ocean crust. That sounds kind of strange. 
Um, so the ocean crust, when it meets the continental crust, gets pushed underneath the continent. And as it gets pushed down, that's called subduction, there'll be bits and bits of it that start to melt. And as it melts, that magma is going to start to rise up to the surface. Uh, and this will form these things known as continental volcanic arcs. So a long string of volcanoes forms along this thing um, on the continent. Okay. Um, so uh, examples of that might be the Andes, the Cascades, the Sierra Nevada mountains. All those mountain ranges are formed because a subducting oceanic plate is pushing underneath uh, that piece of continental plate. Here's a nice photo of that, a nice little drawing. So you've got the oceanic crust there subducting down underneath the continental crust. And as some of it's melted, uh, it rises up and it forms this whole volcanic uh, continental arc along there. Okay, let's talk oceanic to oceanic. So that's what happens if an ocean meets continent, but what happens if oceanic crust meets oceanic crusts? Well, uh, obviously one of those oceanic crusts is going to subduct. One's going underneath the other, but which one? The one that goes underneath, the one that gets pushed down, is the older oceanic crust. So check this out. When oceanic crust first forms, um, it's, it's considerably hotter, which makes it somewhat less dense. So it floats a little bit higher on the asthenosphere. As it moves away from the, the mid-ocean ridge where it formed, the further it gets away, the older it gets, the heavier that it gets, the more it sinks. So when you have two pieces of oceanic crust that meet, the older one, which is heavier, will always get pushed underneath the younger one. Now, what happens along one of these? Well, when this happens, you get another uh, set of volcanic arcs. You get a big, long line of, 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 of volcanoes, only this time, since we're talking about oceanic crust, they happened in, in the ocean, and we call those islands. So volcanic island arcs go along with those. And we've got lots of those examples of those types of islands. Uh, the Aleutian Islands, the Mariana Islands, the Tonga Islands, uh, they all form when something like this happens. So you can see there's some oceanic lithosphere on both sides. Two oceanic uh, plates are meeting. And the oceanic lithosphere that's older gets pushed underneath the other one there that's subducting. And as it melts, uh, up come a whole chain of islands. Uh, this also forms another unique uh, thing known as a trench, an oceanic trench. So when two plates meet and collide, and one subducts, the deepest areas of the entire ocean are formed. And that's those trenches that go down there where the subduction is occurring. Whether it's continental to ocean or ocean to ocean, uh, these trenches form where they collide. Now that's the plate, notice the plate material is being destroyed there, right? So if, if divergent boundaries are making new material, right, the earth would get, get bigger if there wasn't some place where it was being destroyed. So it's being destroyed along these subducting zones where you have convergent boundaries. Okay, let's talk about the, the last type of convergence here, and that would be when continent collides with continent. When you have continental to continental convergence, uh, you're going to have the formation of mountains. And these are not little mountains, these will be very large mountains. For instance, the Himalaya Mountains were formed by the collision of India so um, with the rest of Asia. So the humongous mountain range, in fact, it's still colliding and crumpling the crust and pushing up those mountains. They're still growing. Um, so let's take a look here at what's going on there. So we've got the collision of two continental plates um, as the ocean plate had disappeared underneath there. And when the two continents collide, uh, there's really nowhere for the, them to go but up. So they just kind of crumple and push up and down um, to make a humongous mountain range. And that's how uh, India essentially uh, affixed itself uh, to the rest of, of Asia up there. You can see it moving, migrating across the ocean there in the picture to the right. Uh, and then by about 10 million years ago, it's, it's fully collided. So it's a this is a pretty fresh collision right here in terms of, of our Earth. I think there's a pretty nice picture there showing you like what would have occurred 
uh, as India got closer, we would start to see those volcanic, um, continental volcanic arcs popping up there along the lines of Tibet. Um, and then, of course, the subduction zone and that deep, uh, we would have had a, a deep trench there that eventually was closed up when that continental crust collided with the other continental crust. And we know that we call this, air, this uh, feature a suture. So it's been like stitched on to another piece of crust, if you will. All right, so let's talk about the transform fault boundaries. Uh, transform fault, fault boundaries are anywhere that plates are grinding past each other and not actually destroying the lithosphere. Uh, they happen all over our planet. A uh, famous one, of course, is the San Andreas Fault, where there is, in California, where there's two plates sliding past each other and is causing all those earthquakes. But that's honestly, it's a fairly small fault in comparison to where most of these things are occurring. The, the vast majority of transformed fault boundaries are all along the mid-ocean ridges where they, where they go off sort of at right angles to the actual, uh, the actual uh, mid-ocean ridge itself. Um, so I'll, let me show you a picture that it will, it will probably make a little bit more sense if you see it like that. So if you look at this picture, you can actually see the, 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 the ridge itself, which has got the, two, the mountain range on either side. Notice how it's kind of displaced from the other piece of ridge. There's a transform fault connecting between the two pieces. So rather than these ridges being like very straight things, they kind of zigzag as they travel across the, the ocean's crust. And uh, the edges there, the transform fault boundaries, that's where it's sliding past each other, and that's where the earthquakes are happening under, underwater. Um, but yeah, the, the vast majority of transform faults on our, on our planet are along those oceanic ridges. Um, and that ends our talk for today. You can go ahead and submit your quiz.